What is time? Money. Okay. Most programming languages get the notion of time wrong. So I just wanted to talk about time a little bit. Um, even small talk, even small talk gets time wrong. Um, you know, small talk, everything. Uh, small talk takes objects in extremo. Yeah, it's much better than Java. Java's horrible. Small talk's actually quite nice. Because everything in small talk is an object. You know, one's an object, and two's an object. And one plus two means send the constructor plus two to the one object, which is actually very logical. Um, but there's one thing in small talk that's not an object, and that's time. Uh, because they get time wrong. And, uh, there are all these other sort of things we have when we program, like failure and scalability, which aren't objects. So we can turn them into objects. We can, we can actually reason about them, and we can program with them. Uh, but you sort of leave them out of most languages. I just want to sort of illustrate this by, by just talking a little bit about time. And um, when I was a physicist, uh, they taught me about um, this, this, uh, Einstein and uh, special relativity. And uh, somebody quite, Einstein pointed out that, that the notion of simultaneity doesn't exist. Okay. There's no such thing as simul simultaneous, this word simultaneous, it doesn't exist, it's a, it's a meaningless concept. So if you, if you imagine two, two stars that explode or two bright lights that simultaneously flash, okay, so A and B are two lights that go on at the same time, okay? and there are two observers, uh, A, you know, there's one observer here, and there's another observer there, and they get these light waves. And if you ask them what's happening, mm -hmm. this guy's going to say, well, A happens before B, and this person's going to say B happens before A. And it's completely meaningless to ask who is right and who is wrong, because they're both right. Okay, so the notion of simultaneity does not <coughs> exist if you are not at one point in space-time. You can't have the notion of things happening simultaneously if there are two different points in space-time. You have to be at the same point in space-time. Only when you are at a single point can you say that two things are simultaneous. Right. So what's that mean for computer science? Well, imagine there's a distributed system that's sending some data to a database or something like this. Uh, but it's a distributed database. Okay. So we have some... some let's suppose we're selling um, tickets for an aeroplane. And we have two ticket offices. You know, one in Stockholm and one in London. And somebody comes in, they says, oh, I want to buy, or there's some sort of information propagates out from somewhere else, an agent who's selling the tickets to these two databases to say, well, I've bought a, I've sold another ticket. So this message will propagate here. And when it gets to this machine, it says, well, you know, I haven't got four seats left, I've now got three. And the message will propagate to this machine. But the propagation delay is different and at this time, it will say it's three. So there is a point in time where these two can't agree, where it's inconsistent. And that's this time between these two messages are. And this is a sort of basic thing about programming. You can never say how things are now in, in a distributed system. You can only say how they were then. So what you know about the world is the information you have retained from the last message you got. You know, so if your cousin sends you a message saying... I'm alive and well and enjoying the sun in California. Uh, you think that they're alive and well and enjoying the sun in California. They might actually be dead. You know, they got <laughs> dead. But then they haven't sent you a message because they couldn't send you a message because they were dead. <laughs> and that's what you do in distributed programming. You're always based on old information, never current information. If anybody who breaks that rule and builds databases um, that do not take that rule into account, it's going to get into trouble. So, for example, uh, you, ca you can't make a system highly available and highly reliable and consistent at the same time. This is through the cap theorem. Okay? You, have, you choose any two of them, you can't have one at once. Of course, the banks don't know this, so they put remote terminals in shops, uh, and they want them to be highly available. That means they should work if the communication line is broken. So you put this bank thing in the shop, and if the communication line is broken, it can't talk to the bank's computer, so it makes an autonomous decision. So you get exactly this problem occurring. So if the communication breaks while you're doing something, it will time out, 
and you'll notice that the transaction's failed. But the money is deducted from your account anyway, and you have to do it again. And it will be put back into your account 24 hours, 24 hours later. That's called two-phase commit. Um, of course, two-phase commit doesn't work. Because it's theoretically unsound, so you might use three-phase commit uh, or infinite-phase commit, which is actually mathematically unsound as well. So these are... But you don't have to build systems like that, you see. You could actually, if you, if you bear in mind the physics of what's going on, and you bear in mind the consistency model, you can, you can hand out tokens and things. For example, how, how could you make an AI booking system that is logical? Okay, so if I want to sell tickets for an airline from two different places at once in a way that's logically, logically consistent, I want to sell them in London and Stockholm, uh, well, London can sell all the odd-numbered seats, and Stockholm can sell all the even seats. Okay, it's not a good algorithm because you won't be able to go and sit next to your friend, you know, when you've got tickets. But uh, apart from that, it's an okay algorithm. And what would happen then is um, you give half the things, half the tokens to one and half to the other, and then if when they're running out, if one side's running out of tokens and the other one isn't. You can swap a few tokens. So you need two protocols. You need the client-server protocol. You need the server-server protocol. And you could generalize that to a logarithmic tree, you know, and do that. So that's a little student project for somebody to do, is to generalize a booking algorithm into a log, a log tree algorithm. Um, we've actually done that, so you can make a tree of processes talking. It's actually consistent. So if you look at some of the new databases and techniques that are coming along, uh, they are based on ideas like this. Um, there's a big system in Erlang called React, which is actually very, very, very beautiful because it doesn't hide any of this dirty washing under the counter. It's mathematically sound. So it's, for the first time, it actually talks about the number. Hey, it's so beautiful. You know, it's a light up. Wow, when you see it. It's, but a lot of systems hide detail from you, but they hide the wrong detail. So, for example, uh, a typical thing you could do to make things reliable is keep lots of replicas. And normal algorithms keep an odd number of replicas and commit when you get more than half. Okay, so if you keep seven replicas of data, and you, you say, well, uh, this is a new value, and you wait until you've got four of them, which is more than half, you then commit. Okay. Uh, that's a very nice algorithm, because actually you can, you can, if it's a parallel system, you can send all them. It doesn't take longer to make seven replicas than to make 92 replicas, because it's in parallel. You send now requests in parallel, you get the answers in parallel. You just count the number of answers. But... Most systems will say, OK, let's make seven replicas, commit when you get four replicas, but they don't tell the programmer what's happened. They, the programmer just writes a line of code, and that has happened under the counter. Um, and then what can happen is maybe they only actually got four replicas, and they're running on four replicas for a long time, and then later they lose one of the replicas, and then, it, and then oh, what happened? And they've got to sort of patch it up in the background without telling them. That's very, 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 very difficult. So that React has a system where you can say, you know, commit this transaction on seven replicas. I want all of them, or I want one of them, or two of them. But it actually tells you what's going on, and you get this has been replicated here. And, and it works very nicely, because it's actually modelling the physics of what's going on in the real world. That's what's actually happening. You're actually sending messages through the ether, and they're actually getting there or not getting there. And your software is reacting to this. The reality is very nice, because you can map it straight onto what's actually happening. Okay, when we map a synchronous message passing onto what's happening in the world, the programs write themselves. This is crazy. Somebody once asked me, um, they said, when you write Erlang for real-world control things, the programs just appear to write themselves. You don't have to do anything. Why is that, they say. And uh, I think the reason is you can map the concurrency in the real world onto the concurrency structure of, a, of, a, of an Erlang program. Okay. So, the, in, in my first airline book, as an example, uh, still my favourite example, is how to write a lift controller program. Um, imagine you've got three lifts in a, in a building, and you've got ten floors, and these lifts are going up and down, uh, and you want to write a lift controller program. In a parallel algorithm, this is completely trivial, okay? Because you make... What are, what are all the independent things? The floors... They're, they're, they're independent, so they're processes. The lifts, they're independent. So you've got three lifts and ten floors. So you have 13 processes. That's it. Right. So each lift has a list of where it's going to stop. 
It says, I'm, I've, I've been asked to stop on floors number two, three, and four, and I'm moving up. That's what the lifts know. Somebody comes to floor six, and they press a down button. I want to go down. So what do you do? You broadcast to the three lifts. Hey, there's some guy on floor six who wants to go down. And each lift gets this. It's got its own table of where it's going to stop. And it computes how long it will take to get to floor six to satisfy that request. So all of them compute this independently. They send three messages back to the floor. The floor processes waits for these three messages, chooses the shortest time, then sends a 